Code blue, level one, lobby, main entrance. Code blue, level one, lobby, main entrance. Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, a second year medical resident. You've seen me running to codes in previous videos, but today we are going through the details of what actually happens at a code blue. And I'll be telling you what the odds are of actually bringing somebody back to life. A code blue is a medical emergency. That could be someone's heart stops, or they're having trouble breathing, or they're about to stop breathing. Uh, maybe they're having a seizure, or they're completely unresponsive. The goal is to get people, resources, equipment, all to the emergency. So a code blue can be initiated by anybody in the hospital. Usually though, it's the bedside nurse because they're always in and out checking in on the patients. So if a nurse is at the patient's bed and they want to call a code blue, there are two ways to get this started. One, there can often be an actual button, sometimes a blue button, and you just push that to start the code blue process. Or if they can't reach that, the patient's call bell, so what the patient usually pushes to call the nurse, they can rip that out of the wall, and then that will also alert the business clerk at the front desk by the nursing station. When the business clerk hears about the emergency, they'll immediately pick up the phone and call paging. Now there's a dedicated line so that it's always available for emergencies. Paging will pick up and then will ask what type of emergency it is, so what kind of code, and where it's located. Then they're going to send a notification overhead in the hospital so we can all hear it. Plus, they're going to send a notification to our pagers, and that'll say code blue, and then the location. Next, they'll go and open up all the locked doors in the hospital. And this is particularly important so that all the people who need to get to an emergency can get there as quickly as possible and they're not locked in anywhere. This sends a whole bunch of people into action. You'll get doctors from internal medicine like me, anesthesia or ICU depending what hospital you're at, and of course medical students come as well. Then you've got nurses coming from the ICU who are bringing a code blue cart, and nurses from the ward and nursing students. Respiratory therapists and respiratory therapy students may also show up. And then on top of that, you've got security to come help manage this whole situation, and porters coming bringing a bed in case the patient needs to get transferred. Let me walk you through what would happen in a classic resuscitation when a patient's heart stopped and they stopped breathing, and if we didn't do anything, they would actually pass away. First, you've got the team leader. And as a senior internal medicine resident, that's my job, so it's a lot of responsibility. When I arrive at a code, I stand at the foot of the bed and you're looking down at the patient. Then anyone who comes into the room knows who's in charge because they're standing at the foot of the bed. The goal is to be giving instructions to everyone. There are so many people in the room that you are organizing this chaos. Then people are reporting back to you with any information. So you're gathering information to try to figure out one, what caused this patient to get so sick and two, how are you going to treat them? And the key is that whatever's going on, I need to be alerted to it. So if I say push one milligram of epinephrine, nurse will go push it. They're going to come back and say one milligram of epinephrine is in. So all this closed loop communication always comes back to the team leader. Next, a lineup forms to do CPR. So this is often medical students, junior residents, nursing students, nurses all line up. Usually I would say four to five people. And CPR is exhausting. So you try to do two minutes at a time, but if someone is obviously getting exhausted, it's my job as the team leader to say, you need to switch out because CPR is the most important thing that you can do to bring somebody back. So you need high quality CPR. Then there's someone at the head of the bed, so that's managing airway. And that's often anesthesia, respiratory therapy, it could be um, internal medicine or ICU, but some kind of physician or respiratory therapist bagging, so forcing air down into the lungs through a mask that's covering the mouth and the nose. And then as the code goes on, they often get intubated. So that's putting a tube down the patient's throat. Then you've got nurses who are dedicated to giving medications, starting IVs if we need, and then getting code blood work. All the supplies that you need come from the crash cart or the code blue cart. You've got all the different medications, heart monitors, IV equipment, 
and even oxygen. So this way the resuscitation can happen anywhere in the hospital, not just a patient's room. Then a resident is tasked to go and get the chart and find out information about the patient, like their past medical history, what kind of medications they're on, if anything's been changed today. Then somebody's in charge of going and calling the family to give them an update and let them know what's happening right away. If the family's present or they show up while we're doing the code, someone will step outside and take them aside to explain what's going on because it can be so incredibly overwhelming and scary. There's actually evidence and studies that have been done showing that if family members are offered the opportunity to go in and watch the resuscitation, that there's less incidence of PTSD and stress, afterwards depression or anxiety. And I think the reason for that is that they get to witness that we've done every single thing possible for that patient. So when does the resuscitation end? Best case scenario is that we're able to get a heartbeat back. Um, it's not like in the movies, you don't get it back and someone opens up their eyes and sits up. These people are very sick, they're still sort of touch and go, and um, they're often still unconscious with a breathing tube down their throat, and at that point we're transferring them to the ICU for more care. Unfortunately, this is often not the case, and patients often don't make it. And in that scenario, it's about a decision for when to stop CPR. So at that point, I usually make a summary of everything we've done to, to that point. So I actually say it out loud to the room and I ask, does anybody else have any other suggestions? Because nobody should walk out of there thinking, I wish we had done that or why didn't we do this? Everyone should voice their opinion. And if no one has any other solutions or suggestions, at that point, I usually say, let's finish this round of CPR. We'll check for a pulse, you check for breathing, check their pupils. And if there's still no sign of life, we call the end of the code and you call time of death. Codes can last for 20 to 40 minutes depending on the scenario and it's, um, it's always sad when they end and, and you don't get a patient back. So you're probably wondering how often do we actually bring somebody back to life? And of course the answer is it depends. So it depends on what caused them to have the arrest, it depends how healthy they were in advance, and also how quickly CPR was started. So studies have shown that if it's a witnessed arrest, meaning you actually watch their heart stop and you start CPR right away, then there's about 50% chance that you get the patient back. But there's only about a 20% chance, so one in five, that a patient ever leaves the hospital, which gives you a sense of how incredibly sick people are if they get to that point. Unfortunately, if it was an unwitnessed arrest, meaning we don't know how long it was between the person's heart stopping and starting CPR, there's only about a 1% chance that that patient will ever leave the hospital. You can imagine this is a huge trauma to someone's body, often breaking the sternum and ribs. They end up on a ventilator in the ICU and not everybody wants the end of their life to be like that. And so we ask everybody who comes into the hospital about their goals of care. What do they want us to do if their heart stops or if they stop breathing? Do they want to go through all of this? Because if we don't hear otherwise, our assumption is to do everything for everybody, of course. Anyway, I feel very passionate about this topic um, and about goals of care and end of life planning. So at some point I would love to chat with you guys about that more. There just isn't really time now. So I know that was a ton of information. So if you have any questions about Code Blues, what it's like, um, things I didn't mention, just let me know in the comments below. And if you want to know about other color code emergencies, like Code White, Code Purple, Code Yellow, check out this video where I go through and explain all of it. Anyway, I'll be chatting with you guys next week. So bye for now.